Say, has anybody seen the Walla Bear? Where could he be? I've looked all over the campground for him. He's Not nowhere. Paul, I forgot. Walla Bear told me to give you this note. He said it's very important. Very important? Hmm. Let's see. It's kind of hard to read his handwriting. But that's because he's a Walla Bear. Dear Counselor Carl, I am at the Pensacola Junior College Planetarium with my pals, Happy Campers Matthew and Thomas. We are with Clinton Hatchett, and he's showing us about how planetariums work. Welcome to the Science and Space Theater here at Pensacola Junior College. Let's go right on in. As you can see, there are a lot of exhibits here in our lobby area, but we're going to go around the corner over here right into the theater. If you follow me. Now, Miss Memory, if you would, please display all the objects in the suspect solar system. At the center of the system is an average-sized, middle-aged yellow star. Orbiting this star are nine planets. Starting closest to the sun and working outward, they are known as Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Several of the planets have other objects, moons, or rings orbiting them. There also seems to be some additional material located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, plus a few comets and some space dust scattered throughout the system. Well, Elmo, which one looks like the best source of those transmissions? Gee, Sam, just from looking at him, I'd say Jupiter's the best suspect because it's the biggest. That sounds good to me. Okay, computer, please show us what you have in the file on Jupiter. Look, Sam, it's staring at us with a giant eye. This is Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system. Jupiter is bigger and heavier than all the other planets in this solar system combined. The atmosphere is composed mostly of hydrogen and helium, with smaller amounts of methane, ammonia, and other compounds. As the planet rotates, these gases <laughs> form belts and zones, and whirlpools where clouds moving at different speeds collide. It sort of looks like someone mixed up all different kinds of salad dressing. It was once believed that Jupiter was composed entirely of gases <laughs> with no solid matter. But some theories now suggest that beneath that colorful exterior lies a small rocky core. Powerful currents in the cloud layers and Jupiter's rotation time of less than 10 hours makes for some pretty violent weather. That feature that looks like a giant eye is called the Great Red Spot. It's the largest of many storms and has been observed for over 300 years. Well, now we're in the main planetarium chamber, and you've just seen a little bit of Planet Patrol, which is uh, one of the many programs that we do here. A planetarium is actually made up of several main components. The dome, which is the big hemispherical screen over your head. Ours is 40 feet in diameter, putting us in the major planetarium class. We also have slide projectors behind the dome and in our projection booth, a video projection system, and a fantastic sound system. But the heart of the system is really the Digistar, which is what we're most excited about. That's what allows us to do our computer graphics effects.
can open the Digistar lens cover up for you so you can see the spectacular fisheye lens which allows us to project the computer screen onto our dome. Uh, we have a lot of different projectors here, but the really wide angle 3D effect that we get is with Digistar. It has a high intensity computer screen inside and it's connected to some computers in the back room. The projector is what we think of as the heart of the system. The brains of the system are really back at our control console and in the back room where we have the computers located and the graphics processor. So in a moment, we'll take a look at, at those. We'll have a chance to find out how the system really works here, how we put our programs together. How do rabbits travel? I give up. How do rabbits travel? By airplanes. <sighs> It says here that swamis know a lot of stuff. Now let's go see what Tommy the Swami knows. Mm. Mm. Greetings, curious ones. I was just pondering on something truly incredible. The universe. Now, the planet where you and I live, that would be Earth, is in what's called the solar system. Now, our solar system is part of a galaxy called the Milky Way. And beyond that are thousands, maybe millions of other galaxies and star systems. All of these things make up what's called the universe. According to some experts, the universe is limitless. This means that it is always changing and growing. And by now you're probably saying, Sami the Swami, get to the point for crying out loud. Okay, okay, I get to the point. Your mind is your own personal universe. It is always working and changing and growing. Therefore, your mind is limitless. But there is just one catch. Your mind won't be limitless if you do not use it. So read as many books as you can. Do lots of math problems. Ask questions as often as possible. And continue to expand your universe. So until next time, Sim Salabim, and may the road to enlightenment be free of bottles. Welcome back. I'm glad you could join us at the planetarium this morning. The boys and I were just discussing how we do some of the graphics you see on the dome. Um, this is the brains of the system right here, the Digistar. This is the preview monitor where we actually see what, what you see on the dome. The middle of the screen is actually where the top of your head would be, so to speak, and this is the front down here of the dome. Um, one of the things we can do with this system is uh, simulate virtual reality, so to speak. Um, we can put you, for instance, in this object. You can't tell really what it is. It could be a black hole as we travel deeper into it. And as we zoom back out, you find out it's a seashell. And we can turn the seashell around. We can view it from any angle. We can spin it. And um, well, that's a lot of what we do. Um, we've got all kinds of objects that we can show. Um, and all of these are really math in motion. All these are described by formulas and by um, coordinates on a graphing system. So if you think science and math are boring, well, you know, you can see that they aren't. We can even do things like take you through a tour of um, cities. Let me get this going real quick. take a moment. And um, we're going through the galaxies. It can literally take you down the streets. There's churches, and if you were to, if you were to go to St. Louis, you'd see some of these landmarks. And in a second, it'll actually take you below St. Louis, and you can kind of see it from the sewer, sewer level. And one of our, our planned projects here is to do something similar for Pensacola to um, fly you maybe over or under the, the Bay Bridge and things like that. There's the Capitol right there. Go underneath. I believe we're going to blast through one of these buildings in a moment. Right here. And when you're sitting in the theater, it 
actually does feel like you're moving because you're, you're, you're feeling it from all, all, all directions. Do you think you might be interested in doing something like this when you grow up? Well, you want to concentrate on your math and your sciences and your computers and um, you know, even the reading because then you get more ideas of um, what kind of images people might want to see. Let's go visit Jay Walla Walla Bank. Well, hey there. Looks like you caught me in the middle of something big. But I always have a couple of minutes for you, and I'm glad you're here. Because today, I'd like to talk about something really big. Stars. Now, you might think that I'm talking about the kind of stars that are big and bright and shine at night deep in the heart of Texas. But did you know that people can be stars too? That's right. Somebody that's famous for what they do, whether it's sports, art, music, or even business, we call that person a star. Why? Simple. Because they always shine at whatever they do. Now, do you think that they became stars overnight? Heck no. It took a lot of hard work, practice, and determination to get them where they are. And most importantly, they never quit. Even after they became stars, they continue to work at what they do. So take it from old Jay Walter Wallbanger. You want to be a star in whatever you do, reach for one. Work hard, don't quit, and always remember that you're never too small to think big. Let's take a look at telescopes with Dr. Frank Palma. I hope you enjoyed your planetarium program. How about a look at the real sky with some telescopes? This is everybody's idea of a telescope, kind of like Captain Hook's spyglass. A great big long tube. It has a lens up in the front end which looks at the sky or can be looking at a shrimp boat or whatever you'd like to look at. Back at the other end is where you put your eye and there's a little lens back here that magnifies the picture we get from the big lens. So this is called a refracting telescope. The refractor uh, uses a big lens in the front and a small lens at the back end and a little focusing. And uh, it may have a finder scope on it, maybe like this, maybe a little different shape to aim the bigger telescope. There may also be a little dust cover that fits over the end, or in this case, a dew cap at night. A lot of times uh, when it's foggy or a little damp, which it is along the Gulf Coast, a uh, little water will condense on the uh, end of the lens, so the dew cap kind of keeps it from fogging up so you can see better. Uh, this is the kind of telescope you're liable to find on the shelf at Kmart or Walmart or any of the service merchandise or any of the uh, stores that sell camera equipment, and, and uh, that's where you'll generally find telescopes. It's too bad, though, they come on a rickety little stand, and sometimes it's kind of hard to point them exactly at something. Um, the stand is just as important as the telescope itself because if you can't point it at something, what good is it? Now about 300 years ago, Isaac Newton invented a kind of a telescope that only used an eyepiece at one end and didn't use a lens in the front end and it has a different shape. This is a reflecting telescope. Way at the bottom of the tube is a curved mirror. And the curved mirror behaves the same way as the big lens did in that first telescope we looked at. Uh, it focuses the light out to the front end, but of course if we put our head there to look, 
we're going to block the light from going down to the tube. Newton was a smart man, he was a genius. He put a small mirror in the front end of the telescope here. You might be able to see the back end of it there. I wouldn't go too close though because the sun is out today and the sunlight is coming to a focus here. It's really dangerous uh, to look at the sun through a telescope because all that sunlight is very strong and bright and hot and comes focused down to a point. So you could either possibly even burn your eyes. You've got to be real careful not to use the telescope with the sun. We're going to play a little trick here. Um, this uh, image is going to come out to the side. This little, this little mirror shines the image out to the side, and then we magnify it again with this eyepiece. But we're not going to look into the eyepiece. We're going to try to focus the telescope by lining it up with its own shadow. If the telescope is pointing straight at the sun, then the shadow of the telescope will be as small as possible. So I just jiggle it around until I get it as small as possible. And when I've got it lined up, I should see the sunlight coming out of the eyepiece. And let me see if I can line it up just right. And we'll play with it here a little. There we go. And uh, now there will be a certain spot where it'll focus, and I can run this lens in and out. So we get a small picture of the sun. Now, if this had been about a year or two ago, we would see little dots on the sun. Uh, from about every uh, five or six years, we have many, many sunspots on the sun. They're little cool spots. They look like little dots on the sun. They look very little, but don't forget the sun is very far away. What looks small to us is actually very big. It's about 109 times bigger than the Earth. So if the Earth were like a bead on a string, you would have 109 beads as big as the Earth stretching just across the front of the sun. And if the sun was a big bean bag, you'd have to stuff about a, about a million of those beads into the sun to fill it. So the, the volume of gas, the sun is a big gas tank, about a million times, holds about a million times as much volume as the Earth. Uh, so those little spots we see on the sun sometimes, uh, a lot of them are as big as the Earth, sometimes four or five times as big as the whole Earth. And there are little cool spots on the surface of the sun where the magnetic fields are concentrated. They come and go because the sun is turning over inside. There's a lot of gas moving around inside of the sun. So um, sometimes we see sunspots, sometimes we don't. Today, we don't. And probably for the next year or two, there'll be very few spots on the face of the sun. Uh, when there are spots on the sun for four or five years at a time, we can watch them and we can see from each day that the sun turns. And the spots take about two weeks to go around the front of the sun, and then another two weeks to go around the backside. So the whole sun turns about once a month. Well, we looked at Isaac Newton's telescope. Now let's look at a kind of, this is kind of a homemade telescope. Let's look at a fancier telescope. This is called a schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And you have to be very serious about astronomy if you want to get a telescope like this because the uh, barrel that holds the optics costs about $2,000. And then the stand that it sits on is about another uh, several hundred dollars. But it's a nice substantial stand and this can be used uh, to see nice deep things in space. Most telescopes are very long. We want to get a lot of magnification. We need a long telescope. This particular telescope uh, uses a little, it's the equivalent, it's, it magnifies as much as a telescope that's seven feet long. And it does it by using mirrors, it does a little trick with mirrors. Uh, there's a round mirror at the back end, and this mirror at the back has a hole in it. Uh, the light comes in through the front, goes all the way to the back, it comes to a focus, and right on the tip here, on the other side of this little cell, uh, is another mirror. But instead of shining the light out to the side like it did in Newton's telescope, it shines it all the way back through the hole and it comes out the back end. And here's where we look at it. So we actually look, now there's a little mirror in here to make it go uh, at a 90 degree angle. So we can look in and actually see out that way. Um, of course, it also has on the other side a small telescope on it for aiming the big telescope. This one magnifies so much you could be looking right next to Venus, for example. Uh, Venus right now has just come out from the backside of the sun, and last night I saw Venus 
uh, right after sunset, shining in the west, or in the, in the uh, southwest. And so if you wanted to look at Venus with this telescope, you might be looking right alongside of it and not be able to find it. You have to look in the finder scope first and see where to move the telescope and get it in the center, and then look in the big scope, and then you'd see Venus looking like a little sliver of a crescent moon. It says here, the news is next. This is a Camp Walla Bear special edition of Action News 10. Good morning, happy campers. I'm Amy Greer, and this is Walla Bear News. While you're getting ready to go back to school, many grown-ups are already there, and maybe some of your classmates, too. Plenty of your friends and neighbors were busy this week at schools like South Brookley Elementary on Dolphin Island Parkway. Teachers have been busy getting classrooms ready for you by getting bulletin boards up and even doing a little touch-up painting. Parents have been busy, too. Some even installed new air conditioners in portables to keep you cool. Even some students decided to return to school early because they just wanted to help. While some of you have already returned to school, thousands will return to class for the first time this coming week. Now, before you do, you must have all your shots. They might pinch a little bit, but they're very important to keep you well. Remember, you can't start school unless you have all your shots. Some boys and girls in Baldwin County are lucky enough to go to a brand new school. Central Baldwin Middle School opened its doors to students for the first time this week. 800 students from four different schools now say Central Baldwin is their school. There's room there for a couple hundred more. The next time you go to a Mardi Gras parade, the Senior Bowl, or other big events in Mobile, you can be sure the police are ready to protect you. They have a new home away from home. It's this big command center. It looks like a trailer from the outside, but inside it has special radios that are used by the police to talk to one another. That's Walla Bear News for today. I'm Amy Greer. We do thank you for joining us. Remember to take your vitamins, mind your parents, and be good to your friends and your family. Bye-bye, everybody. All right, well, thanks a lot for coming. We hope you enjoyed the show. Appreciate you being here. And if you'd like to find out more about the Science and Space Theater, give us a call right here at Pensacola Junior College. Hey, we may just take you up on that offer. We'd like to thank everybody at the Planetarium again. And don't forget, write us here at Camp Walla Bear, P.O. Box 1548, Mobile, Alabama, 36633. If we read your letters, use your riddles, knock-knock jokes, videos, anything on the air, you'll get one of these Wastewell Camp Walla Bear t-shirts. So, until next time, see ya!